Good afternoon, everybody. It earlier today. All right. Um, welcome to the Science Cafe, which is sponsored by the Ohio University Research Division and the local chapter of Sigma Xi, which is the Science Honor Society. Uh, I'm Howard Dewald, uh, the Vice President of Sigma Xi and a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and uh, happy to help moderate today. Um, we'll be joined uh, online and we'll also be uploading a YouTube video within around 24 hours, uh, which will caption uh, today's presentation. If there's anyone who needs any further assistance, um, if you'll see Roxanne when she comes back in the room and, and she can help you that way, and she'll be the one tossing the t-shirts <laughs> at you also. Okay. Uh, to keep up the interactive nature of the Science Cafe, we encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. Uh, we'll get a mic to the people and, 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 and get those answered. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll uh, go from there and those who are online will we'll put it in, in the chat function. Um, just a word about the next cafe, which will be the final one for the, the spring. It'll be held on Wednesday, April 19, here in Baker Theater. And it'll be presented by Ronan Carroll, who is Associate Professor in the Department of, of Biological Sciences. And today we're delighted to have with us um, distinguished Professor Steve Evans and Professor Julie Owens, as it says, from the Department of Psychology. And you've all heard of Ghostbusters. Well, they are the Mythbusters, the, AD, H, the ADHD collection. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> yes. Good job, Howard. <laughs> So my name's Steve Evans, and I'm, a, as Howard said, a distinguished professor of psychology and uh, has spent years studying uh, adolescents and as well as children and young adults with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and direct co-direct the Center for Intervention Research with Dr. Julie Owens. Hi, I'm Julie Owens. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology and co-direct the center with Steve. And uh, my area of research is in um, sort of intervention development and evaluation for children with ADHD and related problems, primarily at the elementary level, and have a particular focus in how do we best support teachers as they support students with social, emotional, and behavioral problems. So Steve and I co-direct the center, and um, the mission of our center is to partner with elementary, sorry, partner with local schools across Southeast and Central Ohio. Um, to try to understand how we better serve students with social, emotional, and behavioral challenges. And in our center, we have five faculty, about eight full-time staff members, about 18 to 20 graduate students, some of who are here, some of our undergrads are here as well. Um, and all of us in the center have expertise in assessment and treatment of ADHD, and then we all sort of have unique areas um, of interest as well, some in assessment, some in intervention development, evaluation, some in family engagement, and collectively we span sort of the expertise of really infancy all the way up through adulthood. So when we're out doing presentations at schools and across the globe, um, we're often talking about ADHD. And we're surprised sometimes that despite the fact that ADHD is all over social media and on magazine covers and newspaper articles and you can probably do a test today on your phone to figure out if you have ADHD, there's still a lot of myths and misconceptions about the disorder. So what we're gonna do today, I've kind of lost seeing you. I've gotta, <laughs> I think you're all still out there. Change the lighting on me. Um, but we're gonna do a little game today with some myths and facts and we're gonna share some content with you and you're going to get to sort of raise your hand and if you think it's a myth, you can raise your hand if you think it's a fact. Um, and at the end of this, you can sort of know how you scored on all of these things. And the winner probably could get a t-shirt from Rocks. You could just tell her you did well. You could also know that uh, you walk away with the internal pride that you know as much as the experts. And if you don't get 100% correct, then you get to walk away knowing that you spent a good hour learning something new. So either way, you're a winner. So we're gonna start with some myths and facts. Um, all right, so the first question or statement is, some people have ADD. 
So if you feel like adventurous, raise your hand if you think that's a fact. Well, we'll get to that, Howard. And raise your hand if you think it's a myth. Okay, so we got a little bit in each of the audience, right? Okay, so let's talk about this. This is a myth, but I'll tell you sort of the science as to why. Okay, so the book or the manual that determines how we diagnose mental health disorders is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, and we're on the fifth edition. TR stands for text revision. They published the fifth and then had some edits. So when we think about ADHD, there's two symptom dimensions, right? So you can have inattention, and this is the thing sort of like it's difficulty paying attention. It's difficulty, uh, you have difficulty, um, you make careless mistakes, you might forget things, be disorganized, lose things, not finish tasks you start. And then there's another dimension of hyperactivity impulsivity, and this is sort of the fidgeting, the restlessness, the internal sort of uh, disrest. You can be impulsive in blurting things out or have difficulty waiting your turn. And when we think about the diagnosis, um, these symptoms, uh, if you're under the age of 16, you have to have either six symptoms of inattention and or six symptoms of hyperactivity impulsivity. If you're 17 or older, it's down to five, uh, so five symptoms. But the symptoms have to be inappropriate for your developmental level, right? So the attention span of a kindergartner is different than the attention span of a 14-year-old. So it has to be inappropriate for that age. We also have to see that the symptoms are present across multiple settings, so not just one setting. It's got to be pervasive. And it's got to cause impairment in functioning. So it gets in the way of you making and keeping friends. It gets in the way of you playing sports or doing things in your social life. It gets in the way of academics. Um, and so depending on the presentation that you have, if you are presenting with both symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity, you would be diagnosed with ADHD combined presentation, and that's probably the most common. If you have just the hyperactivity impulsivity symptoms, that's actually the most rare, you would be diagnosed with ADHD hyperactivity impul hyperactive impulsive presentation. And if you just have those inattention symptoms, you would have ADHD inattentive presentation. So we actually did used to call it ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder. And that was back in uh, sort of 1994 was when we stopped using that term, although Steve and I hear people say, I have ADD a lot. And we do want to sort of correct that uh, with the science has evolved and the name of the disorder has evolved over time based on what we know about it, right? It used to be called hyperkinesis because we thought it was all about the hyperactive piece. Then it became ADD because we learned more about the inattentive piece. And then it becomes sort of this two-dimensional presentation as we've learned more about both parts of the disorder. All right, so some of you who got it right, probably our graduate students, <laughs> know that we no longer call it ADD. So if you hear somebody say that, you now have some information to say, actually, it's ADHD and attentive presentation. All right. Here's another one. Most kids outgrow ADD, ADHD. <laughs> All right, so raise your hand if you think that's a fact. Myth? All right, so most folks know this one. Um, this is a myth. Now, again, when I started my career, we'll say 20 years ago, <laughs> um, we actually didn't know a whole lot about the longitudinal nature of ADHD. We now do have really good longitudinal studies that follow these students um, into high school and beyond and into early adulthood and now, you know, some 30, 40 years out. And we see that actually two-thirds of students or children with ADHD um, do continue to meet criteria into adulthood. And even those who may not meet the full criteria, um, most of them do continue to experience some of those impairments and those challenges in academics and social functioning and uh, employment. So when we look at ADHD in adolescence and adulthood, we actually now know that there's risk factors, right? That those with ADHD tend to have more traffic accidents, more speeding tickets, more fatal accidents, unfortunately, higher dropout rate of school, and then lots of other risk for, sexual, uh, for risky behaviors like risky sexual behavior, experimentation and, and on into substance abuse disorders and criminal activity. Not to say that people with ADHD don't have strengths, and those who go on to have um, sort of successful outcomes 
are likely those that have a lot of strengths that can compensate for some of these challenges, or those who have received treatment and ongoing treatment. Um, because we do think of ADHD much like diabetes or any other chronic disorder, that it's not something that we treat and it goes away, that this is something that we start to manage. And with each developmental level, there are new types of sort of manifestations of the disorder and may need new types of treatments. All right, those are the first two. I'll turn it over to Steve. Okay, so the next potential myth or fact is if you want to know for sure if someone has ADHD, they need to be tested. Take some kinds of ADHD tests. How many think that's a fact? Okay, a myth? All right. We're, we've got to run on these myths. You're going to start <laughs> knowing what to expect here. So actually, there are lots of tests that if you go to practitioners, you can get a test for ADHD. The problem is most of the, or all these tests, tend to not be very predictive of whether you have the disorder or not. So one of the most common tests that uh, are given is continuous performance tests. And you may be familiar with that if you sit at a computer and you do this boring task that just goes on and on forever and they look at how quickly you respond and how accurately you respond and they determine a likelihood of having ADHD. You actually don't get any more information about whether you have ADHD or not based on that test than what you would already have by doing the clinical interview with, and getting information from parents or significant others depending on the age of the person you're evaluating. Neuropsychological tests, the same thing. There are people who interpret IQ tests or intelligence tests and look for certain profiles to decide that's an ADHD profile or not. Again, if you actually look at the numbers and how predictive that is, they don't tell you anything more about whether you have the disorder or not than you can get from just having a conversation with the person. EEGs, computer-based memory tasks, um, are other tests that are sometimes given that don't, aren't meaningfully predictive. One of the things that people sometimes use is response to stimulant medication. So they say, if I think this person may have ADHD, I'm going to give them Concerta or some other kind of stimulant like uh, Ritalin is the one you may have heard of most. And if the person responds and gets better, then we know they really had ADHD. And if they don't, then it must be something else. Unfortunately, that's completely erroneous. There you're no, all of us, or most of us, would feel improvements in our ability to sustain attention and to focus and to be productive if we took a stimulant medication. It has nothing to do with whether we have ADHD or not. There are also people who truly do have ADHD that don't respond well to a stimulant. So determining a diagnosis by response to a medication is also a myth and completely inaccurate. It doesn't tell you anything even more likely that the person has ADHD or not. Um, OK, I think I just said everything I wrote on this slide, so this will be. <laughs> Other than, I'll just emphasize at the end here, the best way to diagnose individuals about whether they have ADHD or not is to use methods that describe beha typical behavior of a person on a day-to-day -day basis across multiple settings. That I can have uh, much more able to diagnose ADHD if I can have a conversation with a parent, a child, an adult, whoever I may be evaluating, and know the, uh, what are their strengths and weaknesses over the course of the day. What is, uh, do they typically forget things? Is their organization of their life a mess in terms of where they keep materials or how they plan their activities over the course of a day? Um, how well they uh, attend to and comprehend from lectures and classes for a college student, for example, or even for middle and high school students. Those are all things far more telling of whether a person has ADHD or not. And what we're getting at isn't so much what's, what are the symptoms in DSM. What we're getting at to know better is what kind of impairment do they have? How do they function? Those are really much more key 
as much key to the diagnosis as whether, as uh, Julie pointed out, having six symptoms of one factor and or six symptoms of another factor. It's how well, what it, how does it manifest in their life and what does that, uh, that impairment look like? So let's hit the next one then. Oh yeah, medication is the best treatment for people with ADHD and nothing else is typically needed. Now, remember the pattern we have going here. <laughs> How many think it's a myth? How many think it's a fact? You guys learn well. It's also a myth. And that doesn't mean medication isn't effective. It can be very effective. It's very frequently provided. In fact, of all the treatments you can provide anyone with ADHD, it's by far the easiest. Right? Taking a pill every day compared to other kinds of interventions that are available for people with ADHD, it's by far the easiest. And there's, some people have tremendous responses to medication. It allows, uh, for some children for example, it's the difference between whether they can stay in a general education classroom or not. So we're talking about big life functioning things can be impacted substantially by ADHD. And so stimulant medication is, the first part is true. It is an effective treatment. The problem is it isn't something that should be done just completely on your own. It's something that is most effective when it's accompanied by psychosocial treatments. And I noted down here this, this is uh, the using combination treatments is also part of the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines. It's part of best practices in the uh, clinical psychology literature. It's, it's widely promoted as the approach to take. It isn't always the approach that's taken, though. Do you have a question? Yes? Online. Oh, OK. What percentage of people do respond to medication in your experience? Well, well we've. Can you guys hear? It doesn't sound like it's. Yeah. Now? Ah, okay, so what percentage of people respond to medications? Uh, the vast majority do, and have some degree of response. We actually did a study about 20 years ago looking at adolescents, because there hadn't been much research done for the reasons uh, Julie described with adolescents and those uh, uh, around the turn of the century. But uh, we looked at small response, medium response, large response, and no response. We also looked at with a small dose, if you have no response, what's the likelihood you'll have a response with a medium dose? And then if no response with that, what's the likelihood of having a response with a large dose? And in that study, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it was in the 85, 90% group who at least had some benefit from one of the doses we tried. And we used, in that study, we used uh, Ritalin, just the short-acting regular uh, uh, stimulant that uh, may be the most common. Yep. <laughs> Remember to turn it on. <laughs> what about in the case of non-stimulant medication? Yeah, there are s some non-stimulant medications, and those can be uh, very helpful. One of the reasons people have been trying to find non-stimulant medications is because of some of the side effects of stimulant medication, especially uh, sleep disturbance. So if you think about um, stimulants, one of the most common stimulants is, is exemplified by what all of you got today for free for coming is coffee or tea, right? And how does it help? Well, if you're having trouble studying or reading or doing anything because you keep kind of like half drifting off and you take caffeine, what happens? You're able to typically study better, right? Like no dose is caffeine is a stimulant, right? So if you're driving and you're drifting off, people sometimes take either through a, a drink or through the no dose kind of pills. However, if you have a lot of that or you have it too late in the day, it's often hard to get to sleep, right? And so sleep disturbance is in fact a common problem with taking stimulants. And that's where, that's part of the reason that people have pushed for a non-stimulant alternative to stimulant medication for treatment. 
think about, especially my, my main focus is with adolescents. When, do, ad, when are adolescents most likely to get in trouble and do some of the risky behaviors that Julie mentioned? It's often between after school and however late they're allowed to stay out. Uh, and it's hard, if you have stimulants covering you at that time, then sleep disturbance is even more likely, right? It's because you're taking it relatively close to when you might be trying to go to sleep. So they can be effective. Stimulants in terms of just benefit on problems with inattention and hyperactivity and things are more likely to have a bigger effect, but uh, some of the non-stimulant alternatives are uh, improving in that regard in terms of effectiveness. The other, they're looking for other modalities too. There's like a patch you can wear and other approaches to administering it. Part of that is because of abuse potential. So if you, in, at colleges, is one of the er, uh, communities that they talk most about abuse of stimulant medication. People taking it either to stay up and study late through a night to cram and get things done or because they want to go out and party till after the bar is closed. Either way, sometimes people abuse stimulants in order to help them do those things. Amphetamines. Can, how the effects of what? How the effects of amphetamines can play a role in brain development. There have been some studies, but none of them have found anything f certain. There have been mixed, very mixed findings where they've found some impacts. Uh, the most consistent finding in terms of side effects of the medication, other than the short-term effects on sleep, are height, growth, and they found like a a difference of less than a quarter of an inch in growth during uh, adolescence and childhood in, uh, uh, for kids who took stimulants compared to kids who didn't. So that's been the only brain or otherwise consistent finding from long-term effects. Am I forgetting something? I mean, just if you, I think there's also been concern about if um, you have a cardiac condition and oh, yeah, you right. are con being considered for stimulant medication that there is an increased risk of concern of cardiac problems. Um, and that would be another reason to use the uh, non-stimulant medications. And I will say just from like a parent's perspective, we often do remind parents that 80 to 90% of kids do respond well to at least one medication in the class. So in the central nervous stimulant class, there are a lot of different medications, right? So you can do Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, Dexedrine, like all in that class. And so just because your child maybe doesn't respond well to one or has a side effect profile to one does not necessarily mean they will have that same response or that side effect to another. So just in terms of encouragement for continued problem solving if, if medication is an option for you. question if I have oh it's on this time yay so if people tend to have symptoms throughout their life mm -hmm. and we know that sometimes you can get refractory to a medication in other words you take it you, you know you, you basically it doesn't work as well does that mean that people are forced very often to jump from drug to drug over time that that's a good question what they have found is oftentimes the dosage needs to be increased. And I'll go back to the coffee example. Like the first time you ever drink a cup of coffee or an energy drink, then you're like, oh my goodness. Uh, and you've, it's quite notable. But then if you become a regular caffeine drinker, you actually sometimes need more to get even close to that same effect. And we found the same thing with kids over time, that sometimes you need to increase the dose to have a similar impact as what you had when maybe they started with a small dose that was adequate. But keep in mind too that it's often weight dependent and so children are also growing in weight and so you do need that ratio to the body weight. So that's another reason for increasing dose, not so much tolerance as you would think about it. So I don't think we have a lot of evidence that you know if you start medication at six, it's going to be effective for you throughout your childhood. It's not like it loses its effectiveness, if that makes sense. Right, it, it just may not be as effective as it was initially. Lou? Yep. Um, I know. Um, <laughs> um, are there worse outcomes for people who start medication younger and then maybe can wait off of it as they're older as opposed to just not starting at all? But 
that, uh, for how long you take it and when you take it is an area that we certainly need more research in. Those are expensive studies to do because the grants you get typically are five years at most. And so to study, longitudinal studies are very challenging to do, but that would be uh, a good one to do. What, but stimulants effects tend to be very short term. So if a child takes a stimulant in the morning, it may be beneficial for some number of hours after that, but the next day they'll be back to however they were before they took it. So there's no cumulative benefit over time of taking the medication. So what people think about, though, in terms of uh, long-term taking of medication is that if you take medication consistently through elementary school, you may get more out of elementary school educationally, knowledge-wise, skills-wise, than you would have gotten if you didn't take the stimulants all the way through elementary school. That hasn't, as far as I know, that hasn't been established, but that's the theory about um, the benefits of potentially taking it consistently over time. But it, any one pill is only good for a short number, relatively short number of hours, uh, less than a day. Well, let's get into the psychosocial stuff then. <laughs> yes, so the rest of the slide is on various psychosocial treatments that are available. And one of the things that has been a finding is Medication tends to, in terms of when you're measuring the benefits of these things, medication tends to be in very good at reducing symptom severity. What it tends to be less effective at is improving functioning, improving skills. Like if I can't take notes in school and I take medication, I'm still not going to be able to, medication doesn't teach me how to take notes, right? If I if I'm not good at getting along with my peers, which many kids with ADHD aren't, and then I take it, I, that meds don't teach me how to get along with my peers. So what's usually, back to the point here, the combination tends to be the most effective because if you can have both symptom reduction and improvement in your functioning by learning skills through these various interventions, so behavioral parent training is probably the most studied intervention for elementary age children, behavioral classroom interventions. There are intensive summer camps that are, uh, can be very effective. And then in adolescents and adults, it's less behavioral and it's more training focused. So organization training, training in academic skills and training in social functioning. These interventions tend to be uh, the most effective for uh, adolescent and adult age groups. And we've done uh, a series of those reviews of what are evidence-based practices, and those are the citations at the bottom. But a pairing of stimulants with symptom reduction and these to improve functioning is, tends to be the most powerful. Are you next? I think that was Patricia. Still working? Um, would uh, like intensive uh, exercise help reduce the symptoms as an alternative for medication? That, that's been uh, studied. There's a, a number of studies looking at that. The results are mixed. The most optimistic review of them is it can help minimally. It, it's not going to help to the same degree that met, stimulants are likely to help, but it can it, some, and again, this partly comes from personal experience. If you think about, I'm having trouble paying attention and you go out for a run or you go exercise or go for some physical activity, sometimes you can come back and have a period of focus and attention and uh, productivity again. So in that sense it can, but for people with ADHD, it's not an adequate substitute for any of these things or stimulants. And part of it is, too, thinking about although the exercise may increase your attention temporarily, it's not changing those functional skills, right, in terms of note-taking or attending in class or, you know, the peer relationships. So it might help with some of the symptoms, but not a lot of the impairment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the other thing to... Um, uh -oh. <laughs> gave that one away. The other thing... <laughs> 
to think about is that ADHD can be thought of as a disorder of executive functioning, right? So our executive functioning, all of those sit, skills sit in the frontal lobe of our brain. And you can think of them as like the CEO of our brain. They are involved in short and long-term planning. They are involved in organizing our time and materials, organizing ourselves relative to time. It's like our planner, right, and, and our internal clock. And those sorts of skills are limited or deficient or there's barriers to those skills in children with ADHD. And so we think about if they, um, ha if they have difficulty internally organizing that we need to then have like external supports that compensate for them. And that's a lot of what behavioral interventions do. And so this idea of teachers and school-based professionals play a critical role well, you know about what we do, so of course we think <laughs> that this is true, but the point that I want to make here is what they do matters. So Steve and I are going to talk to you a little bit about some of the interventions that we evaluate, and unfortunately, some of the things that happen in schools that actually aren't that helpful for kids with ADHD, but are very common on individual education programs. So our sort of philosophy is about making sure that we are giving children the skills so that they can meet developmental expectations. So if we just give them medication and it works in the short term, that's great that day they're paying attention or that time they're paying attention, but then we also need to do these behavioral things that build the skills so that they can meet expectations. So when we're working with teachers, we sort of think about sort of three key things. So one is the relationship between the student and the, and the teacher, right? And we can think about it from the parent and the child as well. But for any of you, you can think back to a teacher who was really in your corner and you really cared about them and, and you did very well in school. You can also think about that teacher that just you hated going to school that day, right? So the relationship is so key to academic engagement and to being a support for students with ADHD. Um, how many of you have been bowling before, right? How many of you know what bumpers are in a bowling alley, <laughs> okay? So the analogy I often make when we're talking to, about, to teachers is that kids need two things. One, we need to continue to reinforce what they're doing well, when they are paying attention, when they are following the rules, when they are meeting expectations, and praise that in a very specific way so that they're getting reinforcement for that. But then also they need feedback about the behavior that's not meeting expectations, right? One of the most important ways that we change behavior is feedback. Yes, do this. If you're learning how to play guitar, yeah, that's a G chord. Oops, nope, that's not a D chord, right? We get feedback and we change our behavior. When we think about corrective feedback with children with ADHD, we don't just want to say that was an interruption. That's disrespectful. Walk, don't run. We also want to give them the opportunity to build that skill, right? So if we're thinking about teaching um, reading, if they mispronounce D, D for B, we correct that and we do a lot of repetition to build that skill of knowing that phoneme. It, we're trying to help teachers sort of think about behavioral regulation in the same way. It's a skill that needs to be taught. So I often use the analogy of the bowling alley with bumpers that, oops, yep, that's great, keep doing that. Nope, that's not so right, let's practice that, right? And if we have these bumpers up, then we're going to be able to hit a pin. And so we have to think about sort of the foundation of relationships and then these two skills. You can call it love and limits. Um, but I want to show you uh, about a study that we did with uh, kids with elementary schools and teachers in this region. And we um, were consulting with teachers sort of on a biweekly basis over the course of about four months. And we did weekly observations in about 50 classrooms. And so every time we went in to do an observation, we were tallying every disruptive behavior that happened, so disrespect, inattention, out of seat, um, off task, you know, not following instructions. And every time there was a rule violation, we also then coded what the teacher did. So did they respond, did they not respond, right? There's a lot of things that don't get responded to in school. Did they respond inappropriately, like harsh or rude or demeaning? Or did they have an appropriate response? And that was a big category. You could label the behavior. You could instruct them to do it again. You could problem solve, give them a choice, give them a mild consequence. Any of those things were considered appropriate. But we tallied and categorized classrooms around the percent of rule violations that they responded to appropriately. So if I had a teacher over here who responded to 2 of 10, she would be in the 20% appropriate response category. If I had a teacher over here who responded to eight out of 10, she would have been put in the classroom of 80% response, okay? So the, the y-axis here is rate of rule violations per hour, so rate of disruptive behavior in a classroom, and the bottom axis is the percentage of rule violations to which teachers in a given classroom were responding. 
So what we see here is just sort of a gradual um, relationship that those who are responding to few rule violations, they have higher rates of disruptive behavior. And those who are responding to more rule violations, they have lower rates of response, right? But it's, it's kind of gradual. This was in the first two months of school. In the month three and four, this is what happened. The gap widens, so if you're in a classroom where a teacher's responding to very few rule violations, the disruptive behavior is going to get worse. And if you're in a classroom where teachers are responding to a high rate of rule violations, that disruptive behavior goes down. Right? So it's kind of the power of feedback and the power of consistency and what happens over time. So this is what's happening for all kids in the classroom. But this is the exact same pattern for our children that have ADHD. So in every classroom, we had a child diagnosed with ADHD who we followed and had an intervention with. And you can see the pattern is much more striking. Um, and then over time, again, that if we're not providing feedback, we're not capping that disruptive behavior, we're not giving them skills to improve, that behavior gets worse over time. And in those classrooms where we're supporting them, we can drop rule violations down to just one or two an hour, and that's pretty normative. So what teachers do does matter, and we spend a lot of time working with teachers to try to support them in all of the busy stress that they have, um, how that we can also sort of reduce the stress that they have in working with students with ADHD. All right, Steve's going to talk about the other yep. side of this coin. <laughs> so this is the advanced placement version of the questions. This one's a little harder, I think. Uh, maybe it will lead to more questions or discussion. Accommodations are helpful for people with ADHD. Accommodations, if you're not familiar with them, are the most frequent things services provided to students from pre-K through university level for people with ADHD. Extended time on tests is an accommodation. And it is by far the most frequently provided accommodation across most of those ages, uh, kindergartners don't have a whole lot of tests to have extended time on, but once you get into intermediate grades and beyond, it's by far the most common uh, accommodation provided. Other common ones are um, instead of a middle school or high school student needing to take notes in class, they're given a copy of the teacher's notes, for example. That's another common accommodation. So the question here is, accommodations are helpful for people with ADHD. How many think that's a myth? How many think it's a fact? And for this one, you're both right. It's kind of a myth and kind of a fact. It depends if you're thinking about short term or long term, right? So fact is, people tend to do better when provided accommodations. Because essentially, accommodations make life easier, right? So if I have more time on a test than you do, I have more time to check my work and be careful about it and get it done, whether, I, whether you, either of us have ADHD or not, right? If I don't have to take notes in class, I get a copy from someone else, that's easier for everybody, not just for people with ADHD. But for people with ADHD, taking notes in class is hard. That's a very common impairment for adolescents and adults with ADHD. The ability to focus on what's being said consistently over time and then being able to organize the important information from what's said on a sheet of paper, that's a lot of organization skills that many don't have. Extended time on tests is actually one of the silliest ones for ADHD because people with ADHD have problems sustaining attention. So now I'm gonna make them try to do it even longer. And there have been studies that have shown the extended time is when the kids are least accurate and least productive. So it's almost like a penalty. But People, um, uh, it, again, it's the most common thing that is provided. The downside is it's a myth because by making things easier, we take away the need and the opportunity to learn. And there are interventions that can teach adolescents and young adults effectively how to take good notes in class. Uh, individuals with ADHD teach them how to take good notes in class. But just not requiring it is a lot easier to do, which is why it's more frequently done. Because training on note-taking skills 
takes work and reps and practice and time, right? There's no pill for it. There's uh, nothing you can do quickly. The same example uh, we've seen in secondary schools that students with ADHD will be failing a class and the teacher will say, they're failing a class because they never do their homework. They do mediocre on tests, maybe they're getting C's and they are okay otherwise, but they never uh, do their homework. And so what do they do? They take away the requirement to do homework, right? So then what a student who was failing is all of a sudden getting a C overnight because they quit counting lack of the, all the zeros in the grade book for getting homework done. And they refer to that as an accommodation. There are interventions for teenagers and adults to help them organize their lives around homework completion, both in terms of organizing those materials and organizing um, their time to get things done. But if you say you don't have to do it anymore, what's the motivation to do the training to be able to do it? There's no short-term motivation. You would have to be have a long-term motivation, right? Because you would want to be able to, a year from now, not need the accommodation, ultimately. And if you do the training instead of the accommodation, then you have the potential to not need it afterwards. I often compare accommodations to um, like curb cutouts and ramps. You know, those are accommodations with for people with physical disabilities, right? But if a person had a choice, who, a person who had a back injury, for example, and, wasn't, and had, was about tied to a wheelchair and needed those curb cutouts and the ramps, but you told them, you could use curb cutouts and ramps everywhere for the rest of your life, or there's a very minimal risk surgery that will take some time, but it'll allow you to walk again. That's the same difference, the choice between accommodations and the intervention. And from a short-term perspective, I don't want to deal with the surgery. But from a long-term perspective, the ability to not need the wheelchair anymore and to be able to not care if there's cutouts on the curb or not care if there's a ramp to the building is an incredible advantage. That's the same thing that happens when all we do is provide accommodations. Sometimes accommodations can be helpful, especially if there are so many problems that we can't do interventions for all of them at the same time. So maybe what we do is we do interventions for these few problems and we do accommodations for these until we get improvement with the interventions and then we can move some of the other accommodations onto it. But that isn't in the, we've done studies on IEPs before and that isn't what typically happens. Accommodations are the priority. They're often what parents and uh, people want. What happens on- Hey Steve? What, yes. I have a question, but it's related back to the previous myth, so finish up, but then I'll ask. All right, I'll finish up. <laughs> <laughs> um, what happens is we've done studies in middle schools and high schools, and once they get the reduced expectation, the accommodation, then they quit, they don't want the intervention because 14-year-olds aren't the best at long-term thinking about things, right? They want what's good tomorrow or today. So these are, I'm gonna show a couple figures. This is note taking and it's how accurately they are. We assigned some kids to get the intervention and you can see that's the solid line. And so over time they get better, then we stop the intervention and they still stay a lot better than the kids who just get copies of notes from their peers. You get no benefit at all, of course, right? Because they don't even have to take the notes. We get a similar uh, response when we look at binder organization. One of the reasons kids with ADHD um, don't do homework is because if you ever look in their book bag or their binder, you pull out like clothes and underwear and food wrappers, papers from the previous academic year that you don't know how it made it from last year's binder to this year's binder, but they're a mess. And if all you do is stuff the homework in there, you don't, and you have no system of tracking it, it's not going to get done. So binder organization is one of the interventions we focus on. And you can see that both, this, the same thing again, the dark, solid line are kids who get the training around binder organization. The dashed line is those who get the accommodation. And in this 
study, the accommodation was adults would organize their binders for them. They never, they didn't, weren't involved in the training. They just had like a personal assistant who, which in life, I don't know about the rest of you, but that isn't very available. Um, and you can see when they had the accommodation and when the kids were learning the intervention, they both groups got better. But then after you stopped doing the accommodation or the intervention, the group with the accommodation declined and the group who got the training continued to improve. You see this pattern with a lot of the kind of skills you need to teach children and adults and individuals with ADHD on top of the idea that getting teenagers to want to do the thing that takes work, even if it's a better long-term outcome, is sabotaged by, not, by reducing the expectation through an accommodation at the beginning. Okay, Rox. So going back to the previous myth where you, you demonstrated um, that, that basically if, if a, a teacher didn't make the right adjustment, that that could adversely affect what was going on in the classroom. And so it looked like you were looking at the numbers of, of disruptions, but uh, the person online was wondering, is it the number of people causing the disruptions are also going up, or is it just the total number of disruptions? I guess the thing is, is once you have disruptions, do other people sort of join in mm -hmm. in that gang man uh, yeah. mentality maybe? So that's a good question. When you look at the class-wide data, I guess we really don't know if it's the same kids that are getting worse or that it's more kids that are getting worse. So in the classroom, it is just more rule violations. But when we look at the second slide and it's just the children with ADHD, one per classroom, it's the, they are responsible for those rule violations. So it is declining within that child or getting worse within that child. But there can be a contagion effect in sure. the classroom sometimes yeah. where a very disruptive kid can make other kids worse. But they're often ringleaders. Yeah. <laughs> other questions at this point? So my de messy desk means anything? <laughs> Well, I wasn't going to tell you, Howard. But. <laughs> All right. So um, hopefully you've learned a little bit about ADHD today, learned some new facts, or feel good about the things you did know. Um, like I said, we have a lot going on in our center. If you're an undergrad, oh, we got one more There's question. Here. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, these questions go back to the beginning when you okay. mentioned is it on? Yes. Okay. Uh, about ADD. I know that ADHD also is kind of like not anymore used in some uh, places because attention deficit is not always true. There's some hyperfixation as well as hyperactivity is not always the truth. So the term ADHD, I know it's kind of like not accurate anymore. So I wanted to ask about that. Like I, I have heard different things, different places, and I don't know what is the more accepted or how is it framed nowadays? Sure. So of course, what we're sharing you is, is what's in the DSM, right? And so that is sort of the Bible of psychology. And if you're diagnosed with a psycho by a psychologist, it would be ADHD. And that is the current terminology. Now, um, I mean, whether other people call it different things, uh, but the current term, the accurate term, is ADHD. And it is a little bit of a misnomer. So, you know, if you have just the inattentive presentation, it's ADHD inattentive presentation. So it sort of has that subtype to it. So just to let you know that um, you know, all the faculty in, in the center um, are engaged in research. And if you're an undergrad and you're interested in 3940 work, um, we've got, Luke, you can raise your hand. We've got an undergrad here who could speak to some of the experiences. All of those observation data, that was all collected by undergrads. So if you're interested in going into school psychology or clinical psychology or counseling psychology, social work, there's lots of opportunities to get involved in sort of our school-based work and any of our lab-based work or just come sort of learn about the literature. Um, and then we also do have a summer camp called Camp Boost that is co-directed by Dr. Brian Wims and Dr. Fran Wims. It's a three-week summer camp here 
uh, on campus, and it's for children who, you know, trying to create a therapeutic summer camp for kids who typically struggle to stay in other camps. Um, it's highly structured. It's a lot of sort of skill development and peer relationship development, um, and all of the sort of our graduate students and undergrads and medical students uh, and students from the College of Education often get involved. So check out our website. I think um, the WIMS just posted sort of the dates of Camp Boost this summer and are interested in looking for counselors. So you could sign up for that sort of field activity as well. So what's the longest you followed, say, a class of students or an individual student or something? And is there any take home message from, from that that you've learned? Well, I think the take home message is that there are interventions that work, for sure. Um, and that the combination for many kids of medication and behavioral intervention at home and school is what leads to the best outcomes. Um, and yeah, I think we do have a lot of evidence from, from many of our studies that uh, kids experience success over time and can build skills over time that, that lead to long-term outcomes. What, one of the longitudinal findings has to, has to do with the training interventions for adolescents and adults that actually in some of the, we have a lot of evidence showing that six to 12 months after treatment has ended, the gains in some areas are even bigger than they were at the end of treatment. So that's really exciting because that's unique. There hasn't been a lot of literature showing that. And one of our graduate students did her dissertation looking at these high school kids five, four and five years after treatment. And there was evidence of some similar benefits. There were fewer, but still to find group differences at all um, four or five years after a school-based treatment for ADHD, a training intervention is uh, quite unique. And I will also say that the OU Psychology and Social Work Clinic, which is in the ground floor of Porter Hall, we do evidence-based assessments for folks of any age for ADHD and also offer treatment that's home-based, school-linked, um, variety of services. So you can check that out, too, if you or refer friends. Hi. Uh, do you have um, much to say about, like, kind of relationship with these um like these interventions and then with like medication and like uh, different degrees of effectiveness and like there certain like different kind of school skills of just generally, sorry. I'm sorry, ask the question again. I... Uh, sorry. Um, so uh, it was a, about like um, a kind of comparison and effectiveness in like um, uh, kind of skill working on skills and skill development and performance um, from like these interventions um, versus like medication kind of. Um, uh. Yeah, so we do have, um, some of our colleagues have done direct comparisons of different doses of medication and actually different doses of behavioral intervention. And one of the interesting things is that if you use a low dose of medication, um, you can get a, well, let's see, how do I want to say this? So certainly the higher the dose of medication that you use, sometimes the better outcomes, right? Although there is a tipping point at which um, side effects might be too much. But you can think about medication in doses and you can think about behavioral interventions in doses. And so if you use behavioral interventions, you can also get a similar outcome um, to what you might be using with low dose medication. So you can sort of think about if medication isn't right for you, you could up the dose or the intensity of behavioral intervention, um, or you could use a combined effect, and if you're using behavioral interventions, you can probably get away with a lower dose of medication. Um, but I don't think there's a study in it that shows long-term benefits long -term. from having taking medication. Uh, in fact, there's uh, one of the largest treatment studies done, referred to as the MTA, found that not long after the kids quit taking medication, there's back to baseline. It's over. And these are kids who've taken it for months, not just a week. Thank you guys very much. This has been very informative. Um, have there been any studies or information regarding spending time, you know, in nature, green spaces, totally without any stimuli, if that makes any difference for kids or adults working with ADHD? Well, it, it can make a difference for adults, regardless of whether they have ADHD or not. I mean, there's, like, wellness value to 
some of the things like you described. Um, but in terms of improving the functioning or reducing the symptoms of ADHD, that's where the evidence suggests that isn't helpful. But it's just like, to, I think about it like good diet, good sleep, having time to recoup and recover in situations, like you said, is helpful overall for all of our mental health and our physical health and well-being. And of course, you're going to do better when you're physically and mentally centered and, and are doing well to begin with. But in terms of the problems that people with ADHD exhibit, it hasn't seemed to be effective enough to make a difference. One of the other challenges is like there's lots of new ideas for treatment, right? So equine therapy. But that doesn't mean that there has been a good, rigorous, qualitative, you know, study to evaluate equine therapy compared to what we would consider, you know, any of these evidence-based treatments. So sometimes things get evaluated and we say, yeah, they're not as good. Other times we, it just hasn't been evaluated yet, right? So like the exercise, we do have some studies and we say it, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to outperform what we know works. Um, but other interventions that are emerging, you know, it takes time to get a proposal, to get a grant, to actually study it, and then five years to get the outcomes, <laughs> you know. So we did, some of the interventions we just, we don't have the answers to. Um, kind of similar to her question, but different in the sense, are there any correlations to if parents let adolescents use iPads or um, any sorts of technology and how it affects ADHD? Um. Like, does Not it how it, it affects ADHD. There are other concerns with it, not as much just having an iPad, but often social media and gaming addictions, so to speak. Um, there are side effects with that in terms of sometimes social isolation and other uh, things you might think of from someone who is too narrowly focused on those things. But in terms of uniquely an effect on individuals with ADHD, I don't think we have any uh, literature on that. Okay, thank you. So I know the university has an academic advancement center which tries to teach college students reading skills and study skills and note taking. And do, do you get students coming to you and you just say you should go here or refer them, refer them there? We do have a lot of folks that come into the clinic for an assessment of ADHD, some of which do actually have ADHD, and others, you know, it, it's uh, sort of maybe masked as something else. But yeah, I think there is a lot of referrals that go back to the, the resources on campus. I'm curious, how many people do come into your clinic, college-age students, who really didn't have a diagnosis prior? Is so that the, common? Yes. So the actual numbers, I'm going to have to send you to Dr. Julie Soar because she does most of those evals for our college students. But yes, we have a lot of folks who believe they have ADHD or think they might um, and do not end up with a full diagnosis. Yeah. But one of the phenomena that occurs with ADHD and actually some other disorders too is as life gets harder, we get more challenged to be successful. So if I aced everything in high school without ever uh, having to work very hard and I come to college and suddenly I have to work very hard, there must be something wrong with me because I'm not achieving in college like I did in high school. And so ADHD is one of the things people think come to mind. And that's true, that happens sometimes in graduate school, in med school, when, if, when we get extra challenges we sometimes uh, wonder about mental health problems as a reason why we're not as competent as we used to perceive ourselves. And therefore, that can lead to what Julie described. And that's not to say that those folks, even without the diagnosis, can't benefit from note-taking and academic yeah, instruction. Right. And so, and the same thing with children who maybe aren't quite meeting criteria can still benefit from a lot of the supports that we're talking about. So sometime, and when we, Talk to parents, sometimes the diagnosis to some extent is less important. It's more the functional impairments and are we providing skill development for those areas where the child is struggling? So at this point, we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, one, I wanna, of course, thank our speakers. <laughs> thank 
two, I just want to remind you that we're going to have another science cafe in April. It'll be on antimicrobial resistance with uh, Dr. Ronan Carroll. We hope you come back. If you think COVID was scary, wait until 2050, when more people are expected to die from um, resistant microbes than die from cancer and heart failure combined. Oh, good. That's yeah. <laughs> We'll hear about that. Myth um, or also, fact. <laughs> yeah. Also, I uh, just wanted to tell you all there are t shirts over there. Grab them. I don't want to walk back with any of them. <laughs> okay. And also, I know that this is a discussion where sometimes you're not going to feel comfortable asking in front of an audience. So feel free to come up and talk to the experts. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Rex. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Turn my mic off.